Hello and welcome. I'm Father Methodius, priest and rector of the Birth of the Baptist Church in Pinckney, Michigan. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Prasforka. I hope this small offering will sustain and give you strength to live a life of piety and purity. In this episode, we continue to discuss chapter 6 of a book that is profitable for man, soul and body. Some people who need strong medicine want chicken soup for the soul instead. What they need and what they're willing to accept are two totally different things. Others who have exalted themselves because of their God-given natural talents, things they should take no credit for, do not see that God exalts the humble. They want neither medicine, nor do they see themselves in need of anything. I am reminded of an old brick building in our hometown. For many years it sat empty. Several years ago, work began on it, and eventually it opened to the public as a gymnasium. The opening was no grander than what seemed to be an opening of the doors. But it wasn't long before the doors were shut and locked again. It went through a few new names and a few minor transformations. For a while, it operated as a self-serve gym where patrons were issued keys and could come and work out at any time. Now, in its current stage of pseudomorphosis, it appears to have been taken over by evangelicals. It now bears the name Exalt Fitness and offers a place where people can build their bodies to the glory of God. They forget that in reality, the way to exaltation is to humble oneself. Previously, the recluse recommended not the exaltation of the body, but mourning and moaning. He said more than once that the body should be subjected to ascetical hardships. It is not the strong who need God. They need no comfort. It is the weak. It is those who mourn over themselves who need and who will be comforted. You know that the blessing promised to the morning is comfort. Consider this passage from the Gospels indicating how and in response to what this comfort comes. The Lord says to his disciples before his death, If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you, says the Lord. In the church, the body is not viewed as being evil, but nor is its health and strength measured by cardio, muscular, or otherwise somatic metrics. Strength is a spiritual category. The body's health corresponds directly with its subjection to the soul. It doesn't matter what kind of horse it is, if the rider is seated backward in the saddle, or lies in the dust. As St. John Chrysostom suggested, telling me about the man's nice house or his possessions, tells me nothing about the man himself. Section 10. Awaiting God's Visitation Thus the thought has come to correct your life and morality. Having cast off procrastination, humble and lighten your flesh with physical ascetical struggle. You can skip the gym. Remove yourself from cares and distractions by ceasing your usual business and by solitude, and then concentrating your attention on various salvific thoughts, force yourself to cast out all blindness, insensitivity, and indolence by reasoning with yourself or discussing with yourself, alternating with prayer, and placing yourself under the influence of such occasions as divine grace has chosen to act upon the souls of sinners. Some of you may be familiar with the word praxis. What the recluse has just described is a summary of our Christian duty. 
It is also the method with its constituent elements that leads to the purification of the heart. Praxis, or the purification of the heart, is the duty of all Christian people. All those who have been baptized into the church have been baptized into the purification of the heart. Baptism obliges each of us to live in ways mentioned in this entire book, and Vladika has just sort of corralled them all together for us. He says, labor, force yourself, search, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Do not relax and do not despair. But all the while, remember that these labors only comprise the experience of our struggle to attract the grace. They are not the grace itself, which we do not yet have. Notice that he does not say that struggle is optional. And contrary to almost uniform belief, those of us in the stage of praxis do not yet have the grace of God. We are trying to attract it. This means that although we use the methods prescribed by God, and though we trust that through these means we will receive grace, we do not yet have it. He says that when we use these means, it is very noticeable that whether we reason, pray, or do some other things, we squeeze something somewhat foreign into our hearts from without. He goes on to describe how this foreign spiritual substance is processed as it descends into our inner world. What follows is profound. Sometimes it happens that according to the intensity of our struggles, a certain pressure from these labors bears down to an established depth of heart. This sounds like progress to us, but he continues, but the heart disgorges it because of a sort of elasticity against something foreign and unfamiliar to that heart. It is similar to the way a stick inserted vertically into water is expelled upward. Right after this, a coldness and turgidness begins in the soul. To understand turgidness, you can picture a river from the logging days full of logs awaiting some form of guidance from the fearless loggers who by some superhuman skill direct them eventually. Only in our case, the logjam doesn't move along a predictable route. This is an indication that the grace of God was not present there. Only our labor and exertion. This may be where many give up. It just doesn't work, they may think. It's too hard. Why do I fast when nothing happens? Why do I pray? We must remember how long we ignored God and did not seek his grace. Should he simply drop everything and come to us as soon as we call? Think about it. Once we begin to live this way, we are only beginning to attract his grace. It doesn't mean that we have it. This is a great mistake we make in our thinking. Therefore, he says, do not content yourself with your efforts alone, as though they were what you were supposed to seek. This is a dangerous mistake. It is equally dangerous to think that there is a reward due for these labors, and grace should be automatically sent down to you. He says, absolutely not. This only prepares you to receive it, but the gift itself is entirely dependent upon the giver. We must use the methods of orthodoxy without fail. We must tirelessly await his grace by preparing to receive it, but he is not obliged to us. Orthodoxy teaches us to live in our Father's house once again. We must learn our manners. It is not magic either, and making a prostration is not like putting money into a heavenly vending machine. You don't put the money in and a heavenly Snickers bar comes out. Patience and perseverance must be added to humility and self-reproach. Section 7. What is a grace-filled awakening? What exactly is a grace-filled awakening? 
It is necessary to know the characteristic traits of awakening in order not to let it go by fruitlessly, and so that you might not accept some natural state in its place. The risk of confusing a state of grace with a natural state is real. I have said over and over that many people come to the church for reasons other than faith. In our brief time as a parish, my people have been stretched in many different directions when people from diverse backgrounds show up and get involved. We are open to these people, but many of them have very strange reasons for coming to us. One man came to promote his critical race theory and was shocked when I resisted and even asked that he not come back. He chose our small and new parish, thinking that we would easily embrace his ideology. He left and now seems to have embraced non-Chalcedonian heresy. One interesting experience I had was with a person who had not been to church for nearly two decades. This person had been part of world orthodoxy for many years, but had left over some political business. After being with us for some time, and after having received baptism, this person informed me that they would not be coming back because the thought came to them that they didn't agree with anything taught by the Orthodox Church. I was troubled by this, but at least this person was honest. She didn't believe anything taught by the Church and logically did not want to continue to come. For her, even though she believed herself to be having an awakening of grace, it was nothing more than a social experiment. She had been told by her doctor that attending church would help her. The doctor, identifying psychological problems, thought that her hurt feelings would be helped by becoming part of something bigger than herself. Like a good patient, she took the prescription and joined a church. But it was not God's grace at work in her. You might not like that I said that. You might say, Father Methodius, only God knows the heart, or who are you to judge? St. Theophon says, The state of a soul awakened by grace can be discerned by comparing it to the opposite state of a soul lost in the sleep of sin. It might be difficult for you or the average person to identify the condition of a soul, but not everyone is subject to these limitations. If the priest cannot, to some degree, identify the state of the soul, he serves very little purpose. One priest, a hieromonk I confess to sometimes, told me that with the priesthood comes much temptation. But he said, there is way more grace than you can ever imagine. The feeling of dependence on God returns. Sin separates man from God. A person who has left God for sin does not perceive his dependence on God, lives as he pleases, as though he is not God's, and God is not his. This is a description of the prodigal son who left his father and lived in riotous ways. Many people live as if they do not belong to God, but they retain some belief that he belongs to them. This sentiment is expressed by the old saying, There are no atheists in the trenches. This brazen person lives in ingratitude. According to Fyodor Dostoevsky's definition, man is the creature that goes about on two legs and is ungrateful. And according to Vladika, he is like a self-willed slave who is running from his master. Grace-filled awakening of the soul breaks the barrier of autonomy or the feeling that man is self-sufficient, and the feeling of dependence on God returns. The person clearly realizes his total subservience to God and his absolute responsibility to him. This may be the telltale characteristic of those who are deceived by psychological experiences. They may come to the church but unlike the one awakened by grace, for whom before heaven was just a heavy copper lid stretched over his head, for these deceived ones, no rays of light pass through this dark veil, showing him God the master and judge. For them, they don't want all the rules. 
They want God to listen to their problems about all the people they hate, about their husbands who take them for granted, or whomever or whatever it is that has their feathers in a ruffle. They don't want him to be God, master, or judge, and they don't think the sermons should remind them of that. The one who, like the prodigal son, comes to his senses, experiences wonderful things. His circumstances and relationships no longer oppress him. Within him is powerfully awakened the perception of the divinity in all his perfection, and the divinity irresistibly inhabits the soul, filling it entirely. Is this radicalism? The person who knows nothing but God, the one who bores you with her constant relating everything to a saint's life or to the philokalia, is this kind of person a zealot? We should all pay attention. This person may be the one who has the grace of God working in them. This is the one, not the Sunday Christian, who yawns while the Our Father is chanted. For as the saint says, this is the foundation and potentiality for the future spiritual life. One sees all his ugliness within. Listen here to the poetry and vivid descriptions the recluse uses. He says, Sin first enveloped man in blindness, insensitivity and indolence. At the moment of grace's influence, this three-layered, crystallized millstone falls from his fettered soul. The person who is awakened by grace does not easily see the speck in his brother's eye. He now sees well all his ugliness within, and not only sees it, but do you want to talk about sensitivity training? He also feels it. Grace enables man to see himself as he is. He also realizes the danger of his condition and begins to be ashamed of himself and takes care for his fate. Not only does shame fall into the soul, but with the feeling of responsibility for himself before God, fear, agony, and disappointment begin to powerfully attack his heart. His conscience gnaws at him. One feels a certain sweetness in godly life. This gnawing drives man to find his comfort, as I said earlier, in God. He does not feel like the church is a big bore or that the priest is some kind of a nag. He doesn't look for ways to prioritize his career, his hobbies, and his recreation over his soul. Now he feels a certain sweetness in godly life, sensing the futility of a sinful life and nursing a revulsion for it as for a sea of evil. He also has a presentiment that joy and consolation are hidden in the realm of goodness, which is now being revealed to his spiritual eye. Do you see the difference? Freed from the reign of sin, the soul is free to choose. Many mistakenly define freedom as the ability to do whatever, to whomever, whenever, and wherever. This is anarchy, though, and lawlessness, and not freedom. Before grace acts upon the soul, whatever it may do, it does not as an expression of its freedom, but in bondage to sin and evil. Contrarily, the goal of awakening grace and its power extricates man from the jaws of sin and places him on the point of indifference between good and evil. Apart from grace, man is far from indifferent to sin. Grace has the effect of balancing our predispositions. Before we tended towards sin, but now grace restores to us not an innocence as Adam had, but it frees us from slavery to the bondage he led mankind into. But this cannot happen, says the saint, if the sinner is not given at least a foretaste of the sweetness of goodness. If this were not given, then the sweetness of sin, as we pointed out before, would attract him more strongly to itself than to goodness. He says, What you do not know, you will not desire, citing a general law known to many of our predecessors. If you are going to be attracted to the good, you must experience some amount of it, and this is what grace begins to do in us. 
He says, now the scales are even. Now complete freedom to act is in the person's hand. Freedom is the grace-given ability to pursue more grace. Everything is illumined by this grace-filled awakening. This next section is particularly inspiring, especially because I'm writing this episode on Clean Tuesday. The grace-filled awakening can be startling. I spoke recently about my own conversion years ago. I had little idea what I was getting into, but as the saint says, this act of grace is always signified by a sudden fright and jolt, like the way the abrupt sound of the word stop jolts a person walking quickly but lost in thought. Before and apart from grace, man's experience of life is one of exile. He is cast out of paradise like Adam was. But coming to one's senses produces, or rather shines a light on everything around him. For one instant it introduces the heart to that state from which sin has been cast out and places man into that chain of creation from which he voluntarily exiled himself through sin. He said it places man into that chain of creation. Paradise. Section 12. Discerning States of Awakening from Natural States. One reason that these kinds of teachings are important is that it is easy to confuse counterfeit money for the real stuff. Of course, there's no problem with having counterfeit money per se. It fits in the wallet just like real money. The problem comes, though, when you try to spend it. Vladika wants to warn us against false awakenings, natural awakenings, he calls them, which look and feel like grace-filled experiences, but are not. I mentioned earlier the bored Sunday Christian who yawns during the services, and As much as my beloved Greek friends make the sign of the cross over their mouths when they yawn, in church, a yawn still communicates boredom, crossed or not. Maybe try not to stay out as late on Saturday night. During a state of grace, a man finds himself in a certain agonizing, sorrowful state of displeasure with himself and his condition. But this is not the same as boredom. In boredom, the saint says, there is no particular object The man is afflicted and sad without knowing why or about what. Why do you think the priest or deacon commands you to stand upright and in wisdom to pay attention so many times during the church services? But not all those who appear to have their gaze fixed heavenward experience the grace of God. In daily life, he says, there are not a few of these vague boredoms, each one with its own shades. And it gets confusing here, but I'll try to make sense of it. Some people sense a longing for the heavenly homeland. They feel dissatisfied with the things around them. They desire spiritual peace. They may even be working on their souls. They may experience a quieting of the passions. He says, when the passions begin little by little to quiet down, the spirit raises its own cry distinctly calling out from the heart about its suffocation and humiliated condition in which it is held captive. It asks why it is not fed as it should be, but tormented with hunger. This, he says, is a longing for the heavenly fatherland, a sigh which the apostle heard in all creation. Nevertheless, it is not the same as grace-filled awakening. If you are surprised, I was too. Apparently, the counterfeit has so many similarities to the genuine article. The ascetic bishop says, It is one of the natural movements or functions of our spirit, and in and of itself, it is mute and fruitless. It is the cry of creation, the cry of our spirit bound by the sin of Adam. But it is to this cry of the spirit that grace-filled awakening breathes upon it and communicates to it lightness and liveliness. Sorrow of spirit versus ordinary disappointment. We should very carefully note the difference between ordinary disappointment with ourselves and the distress or sorrow of spirit which results from a grace-filled awakening. Although in our time, woke consciousness has nearly removed shame from the human experience, 
Still, it happens that some people beat themselves up a little when they commit what the saint calls the more or less serious blunders in our daily life. In this quickly disappearing instance, the person is only thinking of himself and his temporary relationships. This ordinary disappointment is passionate, often an emotional reaction to the passions of self-love or love of praise when embarrassment is felt or when criticism is received. The one who, to the contrary, is moved by the awakening of grace, the person forgets himself and everything temporary and sees only God whom he has offended and his eternal relationship with him which he has ruined. He adds the following comments that, if we pay attention to them, will help us to gain some knowledge of ourselves. In the first instance, he stands for himself and human dictates, but in the second, he stands for God and his glory. In the first, he laments that he has shamed himself before people, while in the second, that he has shamed himself before God. You can see how the ego is concerned only with how one is perceived by other humans. The egotist may exhibit external behavior that looks like repentance, but it is easily reversed when the theatrical display does not receive applause. Long ago, during a series of conversations I had with a man who reached out to me online, I made use of this spiritual guidance. He told me about some interpersonal problems he was having with narcissists. They were very upset with him because, in one instance, he decided to act contrary to their wishes. His decision seemed to be, in this case, entirely up to him. That is, it was no one's business but his, under the guidance of his spiritual father, what he did. But when he conveyed his decision, those people became very upset to the point of cursing and threatening him. However, he was surprised when, for reasons unknown to the young man, the others abruptly ended their assault and seemed to repent. To illustrate their new feelings for him, there was a lot of ceremony, complete with hugs and tears. I warned that their repentance could be tested to see if it was grace-filled, as the saint says, or egotism. I suggested that, since they were repenting over the way they reacted to his decision— and since there was nothing wrong with the decision itself, he could test the quality of repentance by continuing in the course of action determined by his decision. He experimented with this, and when they saw that their display had not swayed his decision, repentance was jettisoned and the assault recommenced. In his case, he suffered from some of the same passions as his tormentors. His people-pleasing, though, which is a passion, outweighed his self-absorption, or you could say was motivated by it, and despite the obvious evidence that he was being manipulated, he allowed himself to accept the pseudo-repentance as genuine. We must learn something about the difference between these outwardly similar manifestations. The recluse says that the one who laments over his sins before God has nothing to do with people or even with the entire world. Our ordinary acts of conscience imitate the action of true conscience. You could say that it is also an act of conscience, only it is perverted, lowered from its original dignity. It has fallen together with the spirit from its essential height, from the spiritual realm, and landed in the realm of the emotional, physical. It has begun to serve earthly goals, and has become, so to speak, a worldly conscience which feels its offense to man more than its offense to God. Sensing life with God in eternal bliss versus bursts of exalted yearnings. Vladika touches on yet another important distinction for us here. He says that some people experience an awakening of impulses and noble yearnings, which we could call a movement of ideas. Over the past couple of years, I have been following a discussion surrounding the purpose or meaning of life. I have learned many things while listening to one of our bishops interact with philosophies and ideas from outside the church. One thing that I have been keenly sensitive to is the similarities presented between some of the philosophies and our Orthodox faith. 
It is at the level of grace-filled awakening that we see an absolute and unworkable divide between the pagan philosophies of history, as noble as they may seem, and the Orthodox faith. It is easy to confuse things, especially when highly intelligent speakers use language not readily accessible to the average listener. And when it is not made clear that the Holy Fathers, while using philosophical language, did not engage in philosophy in their transmission of the faith. Their knowledge was no simple faith, knowledge about God. It was what is called perfect faith, a direct experience of the uncreated energies or light of God. This theoria, or perfect faith, is only possible because God works directly, as in the case of the Apostle Paul, or because man has taken advantage of the normal methods of attracting his grace through living the Orthodox faith with its methods. Apart from that, philosophy is humanistic and the conjecturing of a darkened intellect. Speaking of St. Paul, let's consider this wonderful passage he wrote to his flock at Colossae. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. In Christ, the perfect are complete. They know him. They are not deceived, following after lower goals, however praiseworthy they may seem. These manifestations correspond to that which is exalted over the ordinary order of things and tend toward the realization of the grace-filled suggestion, but they diverge widely in direction and goals. The latter push one into some sort of foggy area, while the first turn one to God, show the peace that is in him, and grant a foretaste of it. Often, those who experience the ordinary yearnings, the quick fits of nobility and purpose, tend to be activists. They come to the churches for festivals and bake sales. They are on the parish council. They may have strong political views. They may have a business or a hobby they would like to see incorporated into the life of the parish. They are busy with many things. But when it comes to the actual ascetical life of the church, they feel like they could be better used than by simply standing for hours in church or by fasting intensely. They may have what seems like respectable causes, but they are different from those who seek after life with God in eternal bliss. According to the saint, they seek not after this, but after something. Of course, he says, it is always something great and extraordinary. But nothing more can be said about it other than that it is something. The supreme difference between them is that the latter sort of bursts in and acts uniquely. The Spirit inspires one person from one side and another person from another side. And we should remember here that he speaks of the Spirit of man, not the Holy Spirit. But the first embraces the entire Spirit on all sides and placing it near the goal satisfies it or gives it a foretaste of the total satisfaction to come. The fact that man still responds to his spirit, if even occasionally, is proof of the orthodox belief that the image of God in man consists in his soul. God is trinity, and man's soul reflects this having three powers, nous, word, and spirit. Bursts of exalted yearnings, Vladika says, are essentially traces of God's image in man. It is a shattered image, and therefore it is discovered as resembling splintered and scattered rays. The spirit of man is diffused, going after anything and everything but God. 
Orthodoxy provides man with a way to unite this shattered image, to heal and to focus the powers of the soul so that they are gathered into one and concentrated, and this focus creates an igniting ray. This, shall we say, concentrated ray of spirit, unified within itself but broken up within the many-faceted soul, produces the grace that awakens the soul and ignites the spiritual life. This, the saint says, is embryonic life, not a cold contemplation, but a certain life-producing burning. Chapter 6 concludes with a sober reminder. Awakening does not complete the work of a sinner's conversion, but only initiates it. The work on himself lies ahead and is very complicated work at that. Earlier, we discussed what freedom means. The recluse now informs us in closing that by the first movement, the movement toward oneself or turning in, the person regains the authority he had lost over himself. And by the second movement, that is turning from oneself to God, He is brought forth as a sacrifice to God, a whole burnt offering of freedom. In the first movement, he comes to the decision to abandon sin. And in the second, drawing nearer to God, he gives a promise to belong to him alone throughout the days of his life. Please join me next time as we begin chapter 7. And while I have you, If you listen to these podcasts or any of our other podcasts, please consider helping us financially. Your help will enable me to continue to produce content like this. Use PayPal at fellowheirs at hotmail.com or contact me for other options. Once again, I'd like to thank you for joining me. Please remember to support us by spreading the word about genuine orthodoxy in Michigan. We appreciate also your financial support. To send donations through PayPal, please use fellowheirs at hotmail.com. Check out our website at Birth of the Baptist Orthodox Church, no H at the end of Church.com. Birth of the Baptist Orthodox Church.com. God bless you.